Is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible, because it's the divinely inspired Word of God, and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate, and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you live, we're glad you're here with us today, and we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Grace Street Church. Whether you're here in person or viewing us online today, we welcome you here, and we're glad that you're here. And today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And today is the first day of a brand new start of your journey for salvation. How about that? So we need to kind of think about those things, because God's got a lot of things in store for us. And as we think through and, and we've heard throughout our lives that, you know, before we were born that God had a plan for our lives and he knows us down to how many hairs are on our head. Some of us have a few more than others. Um, and I'm not sure if this was planned ahead of time or I, what can I say? But anyway, God is there and he's planning out our lives each and every day. And he's not done writing that plan for our lives. And so we need to understand that as we go through each and every day. That God's got a new awakening for us each and every day. We need to believe that. We need to receive it. And we need to live it out. And that's kind of one of my points that I brought out last week in our services. And I think, uh, you know, we have a lot of things going on. We've got a beautiful day again. Yesterday was gorgeous. So had kind of a chance to get out there, unhook the hoses before it drops down to 19 degrees next week. And so make sure you get those kind of things done this week. Try and take care of some of your outside stuff. Uh, if your hoses are still hooked up to your house, they will freeze. So make sure you get those uh, taken off there this week. Next Sunday, daylight savings time. So it's the rollback. So the way I like to, to think about this and, and keep it straight is fall back and spring forward and so uh we're going to be here at the same time same time but you know it's going to be an hour later so you get to sleep in just that little extra next week um, unless you've got dogs like i do and they get you up at the same time no matter what so orange track racing we have our final race of the season coming up here in about three weeks and so we get to go through, and it, it's kind of been a different season with uh, COVID and everything going on in the Duray show. So kind of messed us up for racing a little bit this year. But uh, we really look forward to that end race of the year because that's where we take all of the winners of the year. And we do all the final races for those, and we get the trophies and everything uh, handed out for those who haven't had trophies yet. They have that one final opportunity to get some of those kind of things in. And we heard that. Denise and Steve went out yesterday, got all the stuff for pies. So we're getting all stoked about our Thanksgiving dinners and the opportunity to serve others in our community, uh, serve the special needs people that they have at REM. Uh, so we're going to be boxing up dinners that we can take out to REM and that they can go ahead and warm through and, and so they can have a home cooked meal at REM. And, and so we're very excited to be able to do that outreach for our community. And so we just have a lot of things going and, and a lot of excitement and allowing God to work through our lives. And I think that is, uh, that is the key to a good and fulfilled life through Christ. So let's go to a God in prayer this morning, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just bring ourselves before you today. We humble ourselves and we submit to you today. 
we submit to you fully here today. Lord, we ask that you would open our ears to hear the message and our eyes to see the word, the wonders and the glories that you present for us. And, and Lord, to receive those blessings that you give us each and every day. Lord, to receive your word today and to believe it and to live it out each and every day of our life. Thank you for these things that you give us each and every day, Lord. Thank you for being our God and our path to salvation. And if our heart was to stop beating this week, Lord, thank you for that assurance that we have a life everlasting with you. And Lord, if there's those who are out there stumbling and they don't have the answer to that question there of what would happen if their hearts stopped beating today, let us be the path to that answer for them today. Thank you, Father God, in all these things. And we ask a special blessing right now on Pastor Terry and the message that he's going to give today, Lord, help it to just fulfill our needs and those who are online as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So our call to worship today comes from 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. And it's, and it's a, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, to the Ephesians there. They were going through a lot of struggles back in those days, and they were the first, second generation of Christian believers that came through and uh, established that church and, and established a Christian church. And so they had a lot of struggles back and forth with the rest of the religions that were in play during the days and the conflicts that the people had. And so Paul wrote this letter to lift them up and to give them guidance. And, so if you ever are a brand new Christian, or if you're trying to start up a brand new church, Timothy is kind of a guidebook to guide you along the way of, of what you should do, because that's what Paul was doing in, in writing the two letters to the church in Ephesus, was to give them a guidebook on how to live out that Christian life and, and what to do as a, as a brand new church and the struggles that they might face. And so today, 1 Timothy 6.12 says to fight the good fight for true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. And so Timothy was a protege of Paul's. And so he was a pastor of the church of Ephesus and he was a young minister. So he was just kind of learning how to do the things that he needed to do. And he faced all kinds of pressures and conflicts as a young pastor and as a brand new startup church. And we can kind of identify with some of those things ourselves. And uh, the surrounding culture that they had in Ephesus at the time was a, largely in part a pagan type culture. And so they had a lot of idols and they had a lot of things and, and that were distractions, I would say. And so they had a lot of things that they had to kind of break the habits of, of going to these false idols and things like that. And so here Paul Timbis urges Timothy to guard his motives and to stand firm in his faith and live a life that is above reproach. So they couldn't go back on him and say, well, hey, you know, you said this, but you're, you're doing these things over here. So he had to be very, very... Uh, careful in how he was ministering. He had to minister faithfully to these people because he was the living example of Christ to the people in the church of Ephesus. And as Christians, we're called to do the same because people watch us and they listen to us and they know that we identify as Christians and if we wear a cross or a symbol of Christianity with us, then they kind of tend to watch and judge us accordingly. And so we have to make sure that we too minister faithfully to those people and that we live out a firm faith and stand on those promises of God. And so we are called as Christians to do what Paul is talking to Timothy about today, to hold tightly to that eternal life that God has called us to. So as we come before and have the message today. We look forward to what Pastor Terry has to enlighten us on in our path as well. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. 
missed you last week. It's not like you weren't here, I wasn't. We had the uh, distinct pleasure of having a wedding ceremony for my daughter and now son-in-law. So it was absolutely wonderful. And as I, I told Mark the other day, he goes, so what's the message this Sunday? And I said, well, God and I are still talking about that. And, and I kept coming back to how um, we're really having to fight to find truth in the world. And God said, you need to talk about staying in love with me because that's what's going to guide us back to that. We need to be able to see through a clear lens. And um, oddly enough, I got these two, or almost a week and a half early, I got some new readers, um, some prescription readers, so I can see a little bit better without having to do this thing in the, uh, my progressives. And it, it makes it a little bit different. I can see things right in front of me a whole lot clearer. But right now, y'all are just fuzzy faces, so I'm going to take them back off for a minute. This world is in need, and we are its messengers. So before we get started today, I just want to, we can never have too much prayer, especially since that's what our, our foundational uh, practices are, prayer, care, share. So Father God, we just thank you for this day that you've given us, although it's a little gloomy outside, although the radar showed a little bit of snow north of us, that's okay. We need to go through these seasons, just as we go through our seasons in and Father, as we hear the word today, let it resonate with us. Let us hear that we need to stay in love with you. And the things that we need to put out, kind of like taking out the garbage and, and keeping hold to your truth, Father. We just thank you for everyone that is here with us today in person and online. We pray blessings into their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So the one thing I'm not going to do today is I'm not going to get all political on you. Um, I think that's dangerous uh, because this world is, um, well, regardless of where you stand, there's a bunch of half-truths out there, and, and not even half-truths, less truth, maybe 99% uh, false and 1% true. Mark and I were talking about that just this morning before service. And, and, and as I see it is regardless of the political party. So I'm not going to call out any political party today um, because everyone has their own views. And the only view I want to affect is your biblical worldview. I want your worldview to be biblical. And so... Um, as we sit here and we try to discern what's true and what's not, would you agree that it's exhausting? I mean, Mark and I were talking this morning about just to get the right amount of news, just to understand what is true, what we hear in the news or what we read online or what we're reading in the papers, if you still get one of those, is what is true and what is not. And it doesn't matter if, you, if you're a liberal, a conservative, Democrat, Republican, uh, progressive, conservative, or anywhere in the middle of it, it uh, it's just exhausting. You, you just can't keep up. Well, then we have to throw on top of that the anger and what I can only describe as hate that we are seeing in people because of their disagreeing. It's so disheartening to me. It used to be that we could sit down at the table the proverbial table. It might be a couch, it might be over a meal, but we could sit down and we could discuss our differences and we could do so in such a way that was civil. And we knew that we might ch not change the other person's mind, but we certainly weren't going to get into a fist fight over it. Where's the love today? Now, this past week, as I was preparing the message, and God puts all things together, just like, you know, we talked about this Bible being woven one, from one end to the other as one single message, and that's God's love for us. I, ha I had some hope restored in humanity this week. Uh, I ran across a Wall Street Journal article about some neighbors in Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And this is a, a picture of them. And from you might be able to see on here, on the left-hand side it says Biden-Harris, and on the other side it says Trump-Pence. The thing that you don't see, or it's hard to see, is the signs 
that are outside of those. These are in their yards. The white signs say we heart them with an arrow pointing next door. So here's, here's the, the title uh, of the article that Claire Ansberry wrote. She, it was, How Next Door Neighbors with Opposing Political Views Stayed Friends. And then the subheader to that was troubled by the national discourse that Gateses and Mitchells used signs to send a message of civility. Chris Mitchell said this, there's so much hate. We want to send a message. And that message is to say that the members of these two households is this, people on opposite ends of the political spectrum can actually like each other and be civil. Now the question for many of us is how? Because we don't see that happening. Well, I couldn't finish the article because I don't have a, a subscription to the Wall Street Journal. But what I read was enough. That picture was enough. And I did then, because this is just me, I had to look a little bit further to see if there's anybody else out there. And uh, Michael Machowski and next, nextpittsburgh.com uh, wrote this. So how do they get along? Well, they don't argue. They don't label each other. They listen to each other's perspective and look for common ground and recognize that reasonable and good people can reach different conclusions. Their kids play hockey together and their families have Monday dinners together. They've been in each other's bubble since the pandemic hit. And then Mr. Mitchell goes on to say this. He says, I think it boils down to respect. We have no desire or illusion that we're going to change them or each other's minds. Our fundamental job as parents is to be good role model for our children, says Bart Gates. We don't see them as Democrats, they're the Mitchells. We know they are good people who live next door. We love them. The ads and the love these two families have for one another are just simply a great lead into today's scripture. So if you've got your Bibles, and I'm not going to ask you to dust them off because Mark and I have been asking you that for weeks and months. So I'm going to assume the Bibles are dusted off. They're sitting right in front of you. Go all, all the way to the book of Jude. Depending on your Bible, it might only be one page. If you go too far and you end up in Revelations, just back up one book. You'll be right there. This short book warns us about false teachers and for us to help others not get pulled into those false teachings. And we throw that all together and you get a book about staying in love with God. Now it starts with a greeting and then it followed by a warning, followed by a call to be faithful. And it ends in a wonderful doxology, a prayer of praise. Now, when I first was talking to Mark about this message earlier this week, I, I told him, yep, we're gonna be in verses 17 through 23. And then I started meditating on verses 17, 18, and 19. And I started talking with the boss upstairs. What he wanted in this message, he said, you're gonna to have to back all the way up to verse number one and run them all the way through this because leaving anything out. Mark and I talk about this all the time. We can't take one piece of scripture and just make it say what we want. We have to read around it. So it became very clear of what we're going to do today. And so we have to, I'm gonna read you the introduction, but verses three through 16 are absolutely needed to get 17 and through 23. So let's start by reading this book. It says, Jude writes this, this letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. I'm writing to all who have been called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. And now, in most letters in the New Testament, at this point, we would go directly into a section on thanksgiving. But Jude jumps right to the point. He gets to the danger of false teaching. And he says this, starting in verse 3. He says, Dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we sh all share. 
But now I find that I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed, wormed their way into your churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. He knew there was a clear and present danger to the faith of the people that he was writing to. And he was scared. He was concerned that the ungodly people, those false teachers who were talking to these people, they had, had literally wormed their way in, and this happens today. This isn't something that happened and no longer happens. People worm our way, their way into uh, our lives and into our churches, and they bring false teachings with them. And these false teachers, they wanted to justify what they were thinking. They wanted to justify their, their lifestyles. Pretty much they wanted to justify their bad behavior. Because they said God's grace is enough, right? It covers all of our sins. So let it, let's just do what we want. The sad thing, again, is that not even that it's much more than those false teachers worming their way into our lives and our churches, but people have begun to believe it. And churches, churches are teaching it. And it's not true. They do not believe that their, uh, that their faith and how they live have to be one and the same. I can live my life like this and still believe this. I can believe this and still make decisions in my life that are separate from my faith. I heard someone say that once on the national stage. I heard somebody say, I am able to separate my faith from my job. Um, I can't. Everything that I do, everything that I say, every breath that I take is because I believe what God wrote us in the Bible. I can't separate those two. We, that is a false teaching. We can't separate those. What you believe, really honest and truly believe, will manifest it in how you act. So when Mark talks about we want to take these meals and, and deliver them to Rem, that is from our heart. We want to bless others. And, and this morning, um, when I was talking with Lori, she said, asked me if I was wearing a new shirt. And I said, absolutely. I got a whole bunch of new shirts. Because more often than not, you'll see me in blue and purple. Now, it's not just because they're royal colors. It's, I think it's because the way I grew up. Because my dad always wore blue. And my mom loved purple. But I wanted to be brighter. I wanted, I wanted my appearance to match what's in my heart. And so I got, I said, Diane, we need to get some brighter clothes. Let's, let's make everything exude who I am and who we are. So you can't separate those. And, and here, as we get ready to go into verse 5, Jude is gearing up to tell us that the truth of the Bible cannot be compromised. So this is what he writes in, in verses 5 through 7. He says, So I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt. But later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And then he says, I, I don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. So we just heard very quickly and very succinctly about in three verses that God's people, the people he chose, became unfaithful. 
And he basically said, no promised land for you. And then the angels, who were in heaven with them, who were pure and holy, they left to go with Satan. And now they get to enjoy those dark prisons while in chains. And the people who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, who were just flat out sinful, they got wiped off the planet by fire and burning sulfur raining down on them. And don't forget Lot's wife, who decided to turn around and see, because she was curious what was happening, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Can you imagine if God destroyed the people who were unfaithful to him, his, his people, if he deposed those angels, and if he rained down fire and sulfur on those two towns and the surrounding villages, what is going to happen to today's false teachers and the false teachers of the past or the future? What is going to happen to the people who are leading God's children away from him? That is a scary thought. continues in verse 8 says in the same way these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives defy authority and scoff at supernatural beings but even Michael one of the mightiest of the angels did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy but simply said the Lord rebuke you this took place when Michael was arguing with the devil about Moses's body but these people scoff at things they do not understand like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. What sorrow awaits them? For they follow in the footsteps of Cain, who killed his brother. Like Balaam, they deceive people for money, and like Korah, they perish in their rebellion. See, these false teachers claimed, they claimed then and now, and will in the future, to have a special knowledge that none of us have. They said what they wanted to say, and they made it sound important, and they made it sound true, not unlike those political ads we were talking about earlier, or even the news stories that we see all over the news, all over the different outlets for news. See, in verse 9, we read about the devil claiming Moses' body and arguing with Michael. The devil, false teacher, was doing what he wanted to do. Michael only rebuked him. Why? Because he knew that God would take care of the judgment. Jude goes on to mention Cain, who killed Abel, which was out of jealousy. Blam, who prophesied for money and not for God. And Korah, who led a rebellion against Moses, God's appointed leader of the Israelites. People like this are extremely dangerous, and they really have wormed their way into our churches and our lives. So when he goes on to the next part, he starts to give us more warnings. He says this, starting verse 12, he says, When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blowing over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead. For they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by their roots. They are like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their shameful deeds. They are like wandering stars, doomed forever to blackest sadness. Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves, and they flatter others to get what they want. Jude understood the importance of the people receiving the correct teaching so that their faith would remain strong. We do too. That is why we have this 
the statement in our beliefs, uh, our statement of beliefs that for Grace Street Church, it says this, the inspired scriptures, that's the header for this, and then it says the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, are the inspired and infallible revelation of God to man and the authority of faith and conduct. Grace Street Church accepts the Bible as the revealed will of God, as the all-sufficient rule of faith and standard for daily living. And then we have... Uh, Three passages of scripture. There's many more that we could have chosen, but these are the, the most pointed ones. In 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 17, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, and 2 Peter 1, 21. These, if you go to our website, gracestreet.church, go all the way down to the bottom, click Statement of Beliefs. You can read everything that we believe. And it falls right into line with staying away from false teachers. Because if we lose sight of this, if we lose sight of the fact that this is the inspired word of God, then these scriptures can be manipulated and twisted into something that they are not. That leads us to verses 17 through 23, which Jude is basically giving us a call to remain faithful. And he says this, but you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly needs and desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their own natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. They do what they want and they say what they want. And if they say it enough, and do it enough, just like if we hear it enough and see it enough, it becomes truth. Truth has not become, is not a subjective thing anymore. It's, it's what you want to believe. Your reality is your perception rather than truth. We almost need... I forgot to tell Mark I was going to say this. We almost need like a, a little sign or something that says, no, it, that, or a little rule that says, that's called the no cherry picking rule. And so that people do not try to change the meaning to something that they or someone else wants the scriptures to say. But as I finished thinking about that, I, I also thought, well, we live in a fallen world. That's not going to help. People came and stopped at a stop sign. So having a stop sign for no cherry picking isn't going to probably help too much. But it made me feel better to think about it because we really do need it. Scripture warns us that we are not to add or take away from God, what God has said. And there is a ton of scripture about this. Um, and it's there. Remember when I talked about that weaving from old to new? Let's talk about that a little bit. Deuteronomy 4.2 says, Do not add or subtract from these commands I am giving you. Just obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you. The word that Moses received from God was sacred and was not to be violated. And then he reiterates almost word for word again in uh, Deuteronomy 12.32. Proverbs says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. Do not add to his words, or he may rebuke you and expose you as a liar. God is perfect and all-knowing. And to add to his commands is like saying that we are smarter than God. And I can tell you right now, that ain't true. Agur, who wrote this chapter, chapter 30, gives us a warning about adding to God's word. But in... All fairness, making sure that we cover what's around this, in the next two verses, he asks for two favors. He, he asks God that he never tells a lie. And then that he has just enough to satisfy his needs so that he would not get rich and deny God, or that he would not be so poor that he would insult God by stealing to provide. Yet I think the most pointed call out about changing God's word comes in the final book and the final chapter of the Bible. 
In Revelation 22, 17 and 19, it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let anyone who hears this say, Come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the word of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any other words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person, that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. Their fate is sealed. But they've decided what they, what they think they know is true. They can't break free from that. So this guy wrote a book back in, in the uh, middle part of the last century, and uh, it was a fiction, a work of fiction. The sad part is, is he wrote enough about it and kept writing books about it, that there is now a full-on religion based around his writings, and they're all false. See, Acts 20, 20, uh, chapter 20, 29 and 30 says this, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you, and after I leave, not sparing the flock, even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. See, this passage tells us that we are in charge of the flock, God's people. It's not just Mark and I that are in charge of God's flock. We are all in charge of a flock. My first flock is my family. If my household is not in order, how can I even begin to think that I could be in a church and keep it, help to keep it in order? It just doesn't work that way. It goes right down to the individual. Verse, uh, Luke 15, 3, 7, 3 through 7 says, tells us about the parable of the lost sheep. That even if one sheep is to get lost, that a shepherd will do whatever it takes to find that one sheep. He will even leave the 99. To get to that, First Peter five and two says, "Tell us to, or tells us to care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve." See, the second part of this message tells us to watch out for false teachers. It says this, the even scarier part about this warning is that it, he warns us that those false teachers are right amongst us. Now, the last time that. Jude mentions in verse 18, it, it, there, it refers to then and now. So if I go back to that, and he says, they told you in the last times, the last times. People are always wondering when the last times are. Well, the last times are between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. We are in it. We've been in it since he left. We don't know when it will end. We need to be ready. Think of the brides, the ten bridesmaids. I just always pops in my head. Time is of the essence because we don't know when he will return. He could come up and appear right now and interrupt me and I, I would gladly give Jesus the floor. But it may be years. It could be, it could still be centuries. We just have to faith, have faith. But here's the thing, we have to be ready. This is what, what Jude says in, in verses 20 and 21. He says, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. And in this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. People are lost and they are in need of God's salvation. And so what he says next is we must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. We must rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. We, we show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Hating the sins that contaminate their lives. It doesn't say hate that person. It says, hate the sin. 
And just like the Gateses and the Mitchells that we talked about at the beginning, we need to treat each other with respect and with love. And we do have to be careful. Because those people we're treating with respect and love may have a false understanding. And I go back to what I mentioned earlier. This ministry is founded on three principles. Prayer, care, and share. When we are going to meet with others, when we want to love on others and respect others and talk with others, we need to start by praying up. Because when we pray up, we're putting on God's armor. We're preparing for a potential battle. It's better to be ready. Because I can't even imagine coming to Sunday morning and not having a clue what, I, what the message is going to be about. That's not being prepared. That's not being ready to bring God to his people. That may or may not have been a subject of a couple of nightmares in the past. Showing up in front of a church full of people and having nothing to say. But not, not being careful about the truth. From what we are warned about is a scary thing. And, and I think back to, to last week when Pastor Mark talked about the footprints in the sand poem. And, and about, there's two sets when he's walking with us, but when that one, only that one set appears, that in our minds, where do we instantly go? Where were you, God? Well, I was carrying you. God is with us. If we pray up before we go to care, and before we go to share, then we are being taken care of by God. We are not trying to do things of our own volition. See, the best defense is a good offense. We have to be ready. We have to be ready. The scriptures tell us to be ready to share why we have such a great hope. But the thing that we have to remember about that is that it goes deeper than that. Because when we're sharing our great hope, that starts long before that, when the people that are asking you the question see how you are living your life. If you are living your life like the false teachers, they aren't going to ask you the question. And if they do, you're not going to have a good answer for it have to be ready. We have to spend time with God every day. I heard it said this way uh, here in the last couple of weeks, and it was just, a, it hit me as interesting. In the Old Testament, it's just, it tells us that we need to give 10% of ourselves. And this person took it a little bit deeper than that, that t more than just giving of, of what we have. He said, what if we were to give 10% of our time each day to God. God gives us 24-7. What if we were to give him 10% of that 24 hours? That's almost two and a half hours a day. Now, I have to admit that I'm guilty. I don't give God enough time every day because life gets in the way, doesn't it? It, things happen. But we have to be reminded, and that's why it's great to come into fellowship here on Sundays, on Wednesdays, and whatever else we've got going on, whether it's our next movie night or Orange Track or whatever the ministry is that we're doing, or just fellowshipping together. And that fellowship, that's a, it's one of those Christianese words. It just means getting together, spending time with your Christian brothers and sisters. And doing that not just in worship, not just in study, but in getting to know one another. Friday, I had an opportunity on my day off to have a meal with Mark. And we talked a little bit about the 
church business, but we spent more time talking about how each other's lives are doing. I tell you what, God's word fills my tank, but that fellowship with a Christian brother or sister, that fills my, that, that's a, like it tops it off. It brings everything together. So spend time with God every day. Pray and read your Bible daily and devote. The scriptures say to devote time with other Christians in worship, study, and fellowship. It doesn't say try. Devote means do. So we need to be more purposeful. And in doing all these things, it goes back to what I mentioned just a moment ago. We are putting on God's armor and we are ready for anything that the enemy will throw at us. And this, this brings us to the end of the book. Verses 24 and 25, which is one of the more famous doxologies out of the Bible. It is a prayer of praise. And this is what Jude says. He says, Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. We need to stay in love with God. And by doing so, we can avoid the false teachers and we can help our Christian brothers and sisters do the same. And by praying up, caring for and sharing, we have an opportunity to reach the rest of God's children who have not yet made a decision to be in love with God. Father, we just thank you for your message. We thank you that the scriptures give us direction. They teach us how we can be in love with you, how we can address our friends and family and our co-workers and other people that we come into contact with. Father, our circles of influences are much larger than we even can imagine. Help us each and every moment of every single day to make the divine appointments you have already set. Let us do so by spending time with you, first in prayer, then through reading your word to us and then spending time, devoting time, to spending with other brothers and sisters in Christ. So that when we go out into the world, people will see the hope that we have. Not just hear about it, but they will see the hope that we have. They will see the brightness and the joy that comes from us. And they will want that too. Let us be your messengers, Father. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry, for that message. And as we enter into our time of communion today, I'd like to remind you, you know, the, when we talk about being in communion, it is a time to gather together. And we celebrate communion each time that we get together, each time that we join together as the body of Christ. And we bring ourselves into this time of communion to share that love that God had for us. Because God loved us with an unending love. He loved us so much that he gave his only son. And as we celebrate this time of communion, we are celebrating that opening of the door, that new covenant that God made between himself and us. That we no longer are separated from God, but we are one with God to commune together with him, to celebrate that act of love. And so on the night that Jesus was given up, he took bread and he broke the bread and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup and after he filled it, he blessed it. And he said, 
this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. That remembrance of that ultimate act of love that God has for us through Jesus Christ. So as we come into this time, we take the bread, the body of Christ broken for you. Likewise, we take the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. We come to this time now in prayers for the people, our agape time. So we invite Denise to come forward and help him to share with that with us today. Good morning. <laughs> oh, so I'm here to share prayers with anyone if they need prayer or any God sightings this week. Anybody have anything they'd like to talk about? All right, well, I've had a lot going on this week. I um, have had cousins that have called me and asked for prayer. I have a cousin, Ruth Ann and Bob, that have COVID-19 now, and they live in um, uh, close to, well, it's Strawberry Point, I believe. And um, they're uh, a little older than I am, so, and she's already had some health issues last year. So we're gonna pray for her. And, and then um, friends of ours, um, Izzy and Ted, I don't know their last name. Terry, you might know who they are. Uh, Ted's been in the hospital with COVID and he was in intensive care, but he's coming out of intensive care this week. So, you know, God's blessing for that. And Izzy and his, her mother have been um, sheltering at home. So uh, we've been providing food for them. So um, God's just working, you know, through, through people to help others. And, and I have a nephew, well, my niece's son, little David, is having surgery on Monday, and he's only two. And you know, sometimes we don't know what God's purpose is for, for health issues, um, but little David was born without a diaphragm. And, so he's already had two major surgeries for that, and now he's having another one on Monday. It's a six-hour surgery, and for other things, issues that he's having too. So let's just go to God in prayer. Um, Father God, we come before you this morning. We ask that you bring the Holy Spirit into this place and into the hearts of everyone watching. And uh, I just pray a blessing over these people. You ask us to praise your name, and we want to praise you always, Lord God. Sometimes we don't understand the things of this world that keep happening, but you are in control, and we trust you because you are God, and um, we know that your will for us is better than anything we have for us. So we have to trust you and know that um, you love us, each and every one of us, unconditionally. And you will, if you bring us to it, you will get us through it. For you are an everlasting Father who takes care of his children. And I want to thank you, Jesus, for our ministers, Mark and Terry. They're here every week. And I want to thank you for the calling you put on their heart and that they accepted your calling, Father God. For they are here to guide us and nourish our minds and hearts each week, and uh, help us to live better lives so that we all can know who you are and the love that you have for each and every one of us. Thank you, Father God, for never giving up on any of us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. This does conclude our online portion of our service. We thank you so much to everyone who joined us this morning. We do invite you, if you're able, to join us next week in person. But if you're not, please continue joining us online. Share this with your friends who think that 
and family that you think would benefit from it. Because we truly believe everything that we say. God is the ultimate. His scriptures are perfect. And we do need to be prayed up so that we can go out and care and share for his people. Thank you.